day two of the ninth session of the public hearings of the TRRC. In line with tradition, we start with prayers. Imam C. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين إذن صراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين وإن تستفتحوا فقد جاءكم الفاتح نشر من الله وفاتح قريب وبشر المؤمنين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل الله أحد الله سمع لم يلد ولم يولد ولم يكن له كفوا أحد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الفلق من شر ما خلق ومن شر غاسق إجا وقب ومن شر نفاثات في الأقد ومن شر حاسد إجا حاسد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم قل أعوذ برب الناس ملك الناس إله الناس من شر وسوس الخناس الذي يوسوس في صدور الناس من الجنة والناس إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما صلى الله تعالى عليه وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما سبحان ربك رب العزه اما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين شكرا امام بيشوب كان يو بليز ليد اس ان كريستيان برايرز ثانك يو مدام ديبوتي تشير غريشوس ان ايترنال فادر داو جود اوف تروث اند لوف داو جود اوف ماسي اند كومباشن Thou God of forgiveness. Thou God who reconciled people with differences. Thou God who forgives our imperfections, our human frailties. And thou God who is a God of justice. We, the people of the Gambia, surrender ourselves wholly unto you and, grant, and gra grant that we will exercise patience, we will exercise love, we will exercise compassionate heart, we will exercise the spirit of reconciliation and the spirit of forgiveness. We also ask that you will grant us the patience to be a people that will respect the rule of law in our land. And as we go through the TRLC, May the truth come out. May hearts be healed. May families be reconciled. This we ask through Christ our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Bishop. Uh, Council, can you tell us what we have on the table today? Good morning, Madam Chair. Good morning, Commissioners. Good morning to you all. For today's um, hearing, we have two expert witnesses. We will begin this morning um, by hearing from Madame Hadimboj Baro, who will tell us about um, sexual violence in the Gambia. And then in the afternoon, we should hear from um, Dr. Dafe, who will also tell us about um, sexual gender-based violence, but for, more from a medical perspective. So in order to start, I would ask that Madame Hadimboj be brought in to start her testimony. Thank you very much, Council. I had him boot barrel. I had him boot barrel. Do swear that. Do swear that. I'll speak the truth. I'll speak the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me Allah. Thank you. Good morning, Madam Hadimbo Jabaro. Welcome to the TRRC. Thank you. Um, before we begin, how would you like me to refer to you? Would that be Madam Boj or Madam Baro? Hadi. 
Well, I would not say Hadi. <laughs> Auntie Hadi. <laughs> okay, thank you very much for um, appearing before the commission. Um, for your testimony today, I would like to tell you a little bit about the rules within the hearing room, just so that you can understand what else is happening. There is interpretation into the local languages, and so I ask that you speak slowly and allow pauses um, in between your statements to allow for interpretation. If at any point you would like to say something in any of the local languages, um, particularly Maninka, Wolof, um, and even Fuller, our interpreters can interpret that. Um, because perhaps it might be a bit easier to explain certain things um, when we talk about culture and its impact. Um, similarly, I will ask questions, but if at any point my questions are unclear or you would like uh, me to repeat, please feel free to do so. This session will be about an hour and a half, and we will cover eight topics. Some topics are much shorter than the others. Um, we will begin with background information, just about who you are. Then we will talk about your professional experience and your expertise in sexual and gender-based violence. We will then talk about um, a few concepts that would be important for us here in the Commission as well as the public to understand when it comes to sexual and gender-based violence. Then we will talk about how sexual and gender-based violence is manifested in the Gambia. So we'll talk about the types of violence that you come across in your work, as well as um, the patterns of behavior that you've, um, that you've come across. It will also be important for us to understand certain specific terms in um, local Gambian languages when people are trying to describe sexual violence, because that will help the commission to identify um, such issues. Then we will talk about the impact of sexual and gender-based violence. We will then talk about the key factors that contribute to sexual and gender-based violence in the Gambian context. And then we will talk about the complaints mechanisms that are available for people to report um, cases of sexual and gender-based violence. And we will also talk about the challenges um, within the Gambia when it comes to addressing sexual and gender-based violence more broadly. And then we will conclude with your recommendations um, on sexual and gender-based violence, how the commission can include some of those in our recommendations um, and consider, for instance, issues such as reparations in relation to sexual and gender-based violence victims. So those are the topics I hope to cover. Is that fine with you? Yes. Um, you already know who I am, but I tend to just state it again for the record um, as a matter of procedure, Horeja Balage. I will begin by asking you your full name, so please state your full name for the record. My name is Hadim Bujbaro. Can you tell us when and where you were born? I was born on the 25th of December, 1958, at Dankunku, Nyamena Dankunku District, Central River Region. Can you tell us a little bit about your educational background? When and where did you attend school, as well as the years when you attended, um, to the extent that you recall? Yes, I attended Dankunku Primary School, and this was 1964 to 1969, when I sat to the common entrance examination. I, I sat to the common entrance examination, and uh, that is where I dropped out from school. And uh, yes, I briefly went back to school again in 1972, uh, again repeat uh, grade six commonly called at that time primary six, and that was the end of my formal school. However, in 1980, I went to the school for community health nurses, and I graduated as a community health nurse. And uh, after that, of course, I attended numerous trainings, but uh, eventually in 1997, I went to Pedua Pan-African Institution for Development, 
and I graduated a diploma in integrated rural development. I majored in project planning and management. And uh, I also did uh, a diploma in gender and development, and uh, of course, other trainings in gender and sexual and reproductive health and rights, gender-based violence, among other numerous trainings. And in fact, um, it would be a good time to focus on your professional experience and um, in particular your expertise on sexual and gender-based violence. Can you tell us about um, essentially a summary of your career and um, the type of work that you were doing? Yeah, my career began in 1974 when I was still very young. Around 17 years, I started working as a nurse attendant in Van Sam Hospital and uh, a career that I did up to 1980 when I went to the School of Community Health Nurse. And uh, upon graduation, I worked as a community health nurse. And uh, very shortly, I was fortunate to go under training for training center for health service personnel in Yaba, Lagos, to be trained as a trainer on primary health care workers. So I am among those who have pioneered primary health care in this country. Uh, and I was a trainer for village health workers and traditional bath attendants in the eastern region of the health department at the time, which consists of CRR, URR, and LRR. So after that work for five years, I also worked in 1986. I started working with a project called Jahali Pachar Project as a daycare coordinator, which gave me the opportunity to work with communities in CRR, particularly the Sarahule communities in Medina and Jahale. And then that career also, I continued up to 1992, uh, when I worked briefly with Department of Community Development as a home craft assistant for one year. But alongside, I was working as a part-time for Gambia Women Finance Association as an uh, extended credit clerk. I continued working with GAUFA, uh, as a savings and credit officer. And uh, during that time, I received training on microfinance, entrepreneurship. I was a trainer, and I worked in LRR, part of CRR and URR. And uh, this is a position I hold up to 1999, when I worked for the Gambia Family Planning Association as area manager for LRR and West Coast region. And uh, the position I hold up to 1999. And in 1999, I joined the National Aid Secretariat as the uh, regional coordinator for KMC and BCC. And that time was the time when I also worked as the coordinator of the Network Against Gender-Based Violence simultaneously. So a position I hold for NAS up to 2017, and then I retired. And eventually, 2018, I also retired from the Network Against Gender-Based Violence. And in fact, I would like to focus specifically on your time at the Gambia Family Planning, um, National AIDS Secretariat, and then the Network Against Gender-Based Violence. Um, can you just remind us when you worked at the Gambia Family Planning? Because I'm not sure I have the dates correct. I started working there January 1999. And when did you stop working there? Uh, 2009, January. So can you tell us a bit about the type of work that you did um, as regards gender, uh, sexual and gender-based violence at the Gambia Family Planning? Yeah, during my entire career, because I've been working with communities, I've been working with women, I've been working with girls, uh, I came to realize that there have been a lot of issues surrounding women, sex and sexuality, and sexual and reproductive health issues. And uh, as you know, some of the issues, I know them very clearly at the time, but I have not seen much being done at that particular time on issues surrounding that, considering the, the taboo of talking about sex and sexuality in our communities. And uh, when I started working with the Gambia Family Planning Association, also remembering very well when I was at the age of 10 or 11, when my father was a district chief, he presided over a rape case. This case was had in, on, in his veranda. It was not an open court. But I was very young, but I could fully remember 
a perpetrator was sentenced and sent to Janjambure. And that stick to my mind that this is something very wrong. And since that time, I was thinking about it. And my interaction with women give me the opportunity to know that, in fact, this is still happening in the communities. When I started working with Gambia Family Planning Association, Gambia Family Planning is one of the uh, NGOs which works on sexual and reproductive health and rights. In fact, after the, the Cairo conference, where the shift were from shift uh, stand-alone family planning to sexual and reproductive health and rights, Gambia Family Planning went ahead of the government to start working on sexual and reproductive health and rights at the time before the Gambia government even started working on reproductive health, because they uh, didn't put the S there. Government just worked on reproductive health and rights. But Gambia Family Planning boldly started working on the issue of sexual and reproductive health and rights, considering that people have reproductive age group, but sexual has a bigger age group. It starts early and it ends very lately. So if you remove the S, you are removing certain part of the society to attain that uh, uh, services. So at that time when I started to work as area manager, working with very competent clinic assistants, I come across a lot of these issues. And uh, that motivated me more. My role at that time was more of coordination and uh, monitoring. But I went further because of my interest. I work like a clinic assistant. And I normally work with, even Dr. comes on track, I work with her. And then when I go to the communities, I try to work on these issues until I raise up a drama group in, in LRR to, to create awareness on issues of uh, early sex and the complication. So my career on sexual and reproductive health rights began mostly when I started working with GFPA. During that work as an area manager, uh, because of the potential and the innovations I brought to the organization, the director recognized that. I thank him for recognizing that. And I have the opportunity to do my diploma in gender and development at MDI. And uh, immediately I completed that. What I did was to make sure that I pushed for the development of a gender policy at GFPA. And uh, that policy gave us an opportunity to mainstream gender. And that was the time when IPPF, International Planned Parenthood Federation also, uh, was pushing the issue of mainstreaming gender into sexual and reproductive health. I hope I'm not talking fast. I, I wanted, That's to, my ask, weakness. <laughs> I so wanted to ask you to slow down a little bit. The interpreters haven't complained <laughs> or um, said anything, but if you could slow down a little bit. I, I, will, try. <laughs> I will try. I'm so sorry. That's how I am. Uh, so actually, uh, when we start mainstreaming sexual and reproductive health right, uh, then a gender unit was created at GFP. And uh, I remember one of my seniors at the time was heading the gender unit. I was an assistant. By then, I was uh, still in LRR and West Coast Region. But eventually, when I was promoted as a program officer and I came over, I had the gender unit. And uh, when I start heading the gender unit, I have a lot of opportunity to be trained further. I was trained on gender-based violence in 2002 uh, in Ethiopia, where issues of gender-based violence in all its forms were discussed at length. And uh, when I came back, I started thinking how we can mainstream the issue of gender-based violence. Uh, we were fortunate. We have a project under the core. When GFPA say core, they are talking about funds that come from IPPF. We have a, a project under the gender, which is gender and sexual and reproductive health. And I headed that project. When I headed that project, I got an opportunity to be trained at CAFS, Center for African Studies in Nairobi, on uh, gender and sexual and reproductive health. That training was training for trainers. At the end of the training, I was identified with uh, the director Ivory Coast, Abija, the director of the family planning, Abija, as trainers for other member organization of the IPPF. So I was handling the English-speaking countries. 
to be training their member organizations on gender and sexual and reproductive health and rights. Perhaps, so, oh, sorry to interrupt you. I just wanted to say perhaps this would be a good time for you to explain um, concepts like gender and gender mainstreaming, what they mean, as well as gender-based violence. When we talk about gender, it's a social construct. It's about relationship. It's about things that you learn. It's about things that can change. It's about men and women. It's about girls and boys. So when we talk about gender, we are not talking about sex, which is biological myth. Until now that uh, science is very advanced, those are things that you cannot change. But gender in a simple language is about rules. It's about responsibilities. It's about power dynamics. Those are the simple definitions one can give to gender. And uh, the reason why we said it is something that you learn, it's not God given. You learn them. And it differs from one region to another, from one tribe to another. So gender is about that. It's about the role that people ascribe. Boys should do this. Girls should sweep. They should cook. Women should be submissive. It's people that put it there. It's not God given. So when we talk about gender, is that when we are talking about gender mainstreaming, we are talking about things that you can enhance. In doing so, you are talking about uh, uh, the relationship, how we can make it better. When we are talking about gender mainstreaming, we are talking about resources, how we can make so that we put resources in organization. When we are talking about gender mainstreaming, we are talking about how we can change status quo, which is happening in organization. So when we are talking about, uh, you are talking about gender-based violence, we are looking at if gender is about women and men, when it is about things that are different, and we know violence is about uh, hurting or harming somebody. Violence is about that, inflicting pain on somebody. So if you put the two words together, you are trying to define inflicting pain on somebody, whether it is physical, whether it is psychological, whether it is sexual, because of the person's gender, because of the person is a woman, because the person is a girl, because the person is a boy. So when you put it together, you are talking about gender-based violence. So if you are talking about gender, sexual, and reproductive health right, you are talking about people's the way uh, uh, sex and sexuality unfold on a particular gender, whether it's a boy or whether it's a girl. You are talking about reproduction, having babies, having children. So those are the kind of uh, definition I can give it from my own perspective. Remember, this is a school dropout. Maybe my English will not be strong, but people here can better understand what I'm trying to say. We completely understand what you're saying. Um, so in that sense, can you give us examples of gender-based violence within the Gambia? What are some of the types of gender-based violence that you come across generally in the Gambia? Uh, I always tell people in the Gambia, gender-based violence starts immediately when you give birth as a woman. If that baby becomes a baby girl, that's where it starts. Somebody, whether a family, whether a husband, whether a sister-in-law, whether a mother-in-law, wow, why is he bringing a baby girl? Why not a baby boy? It starts right there. So that's a violation of the right of that woman who undergo pregnancy nine months and go into labor. She should be thanked for giving life. But instead, people are asking, why did you give birth to a baby girl? So for me, that's a violation of the right of that woman and that baby girl right there. And this is what happened in many of our communities from there. As the child grow up, you can be, uh, vividly see the way we handle issues as the children grow up. We have a baby boy, we have a baby girl. As they grow up, the toys that we go and buy even tell you what we are doing. We will be buying dolls for the baby girl. We will be buying stuff that she can start doing cooking demonstration and things. We are telling her that prepare yourself. You're going to be a mother. You're going to be maybe a baby manufacturing machine. That's what we are putting in her head. While when we go to buy, we buy very fancy cars as toys, airplanes, 
for the boys and guns. We are telling them, look, you are supposed to work hard to become rich, but you are supposed to be very strong and even violent. That's what we are putting into their head. That continues even at the school level. It's just now the school curriculum changed. But otherwise, when you start reading the textbooks, that is what is there. But that changed eventually. As we grow up, the way we divide roles in the household are gender-based violence. And then you now talk about FGM. Sometimes as early as the baby is one week, the child undergoes FGM. It's a gender-based violence. Child marriage is a gender-based violence. Even preference in education until when the affirmative measures was taken by the government and the Minister of Education where education was free for girls. We know that boys are the preference to go to high schools. But even now, I told people, yes, the, the admission rate is very high, but do we look at the retention rate at the tertiary institution? So all this agenda-based violence, we can go on and go on. Physical violence, we can go on and on. And we'll look at those in more detail um, when we move on to um, other issues. But what about when it comes to um, sexual violence? How would you um, define it for the layperson? What is sexual violence and what kinds of conduct constitutes sexual violence? Sexual violence is any advance that you do towards somebody and it's not acceptable. The person has not given his or her consent. There is force. And then the person didn't give her consent. In a simple language, that is how I will uh, uh, define sexual violence. And either whether you are touching the sexual organs, and there are many, or whether you have actually sexually violated the person. Sexual harassment, all this can mount to sexual violence. And even words people need to understand can mount to sexual violence. The use of certain words on opposite sex can be sexual violence. The way you touch the person can mount to sexual harassment. So there is quite a number of things the way it is defined. And from what you've said, some of the things we can get from that is understanding that gender does not only mean women. It's men, women, girls, boys. Um, you can go on understanding um, the types of behavior that constitute um, gender-based violence, including examples you've given, child marriage, FGM. And then you've also talked about um, sexual violence because a lot of people may only think of rape as sexual violence, but from what you've said, obviously it goes beyond that. Um, you've told us about what you did at Gambia Family Planning. Perhaps we can also talk about how that feeds, um, fed into your National AIDS Secretariat work and the kind of work that you did in relation to these issues again. Yeah, while working at the Gambia Family Planning as a program officer, when we started our gender program, uh, that is the time we even started seeing uh, victims or survivors of gender-based violence at Gambia Family Planning Clinic. Actually, my work started there seeing the victims directly. And then our clinical assistants were trained how to handle these cases. And then myself at the time and the program officer service delivery, uh, Madam Fatuma Taba at the time, we deal with these cases. So the work started gradually at Gambia Family Planning Association at our clinic. And uh, we used to see survivors of FGM at the Gambia Family Planning Association there with Dr. Kamara. And uh, some who have gone like the type 3 of FGM or type 4, the severe type, are sometimes being managed at the Gambia Family Planning by Dr. Kamara. So we started this work there, and we even uh, piloted what we call the male-only clinic at Gambia Family Planning, considering that uh, when people talk about sexual and reproductive health and rights, People think it's only about women. Of course, it's about men. The male-only clinic gave the opportunity to men who have sexual issues or reproductive issues to come to those clinics. Because you know in our culture, when you are married, you don't get a child. Everybody look at the woman. When actually there are men who cannot have a child, they cannot even have it. That's the reality. There are men 
who have a very low sperm count, they need to get some support for them to have a child. So during the male clinic, those things were picked out, and some were really supported. So all that work started at GFPA when I was there. We were doing that work. And uh, in that work, I have another project that I was uh, also handling, which is the HAP, Rapid Response to HIV and AIDS, and the Global Fund Project. And this is uh, mainly working with uh, uh, the area of HIV and AIDS. So I was heading that project and uh, working with my program manager at the time and uh, working directly with PLHIVs. And uh, all this together added up because of the issues I'm seeing. This added up in my career in the work of sexual and gender-based violence. To the extent by the time I leave uh, Gambia Family Planning, I have started working on how I can come up with an organization which will be really focused on this. And during that time, Gambia Family Planning have a consortium also that work in this area. I remember the consortium was GFPA, Worldview, and the athlete was there. She can fully attest to that. And uh, we have Taru, Gambia Red Cross. I cannot remember the other members. And Action Aid International was the one funding this consortium. And my work continue again. All this is in the area of sexual and gender-based violence. So by the time I, I leave GFPA, I've already started doing a lot of communication, looking for funding behind the scene for four years before I, I can actually really get funding to start this uh, network against gender-based violence. And did you start working for the network, um, start the network against gender-based violence before you went to National AIDS Secretariat, or did they happen at the same time? Uh, I can say the, the organization to actually kick off, uh, yes, I was not yet at NAS, because when I started the, the, the fundraising by looking, making proposal was 20, uh, 2004. But 2009, when I retired, I was doing a briefly uh, consultancy work for Hanson Care. During that time was the time I set up the network, and then I moved to NAS. So let's focus on the network against gender-based um, gender violence. What actually led you to establish um, such a network? Le like I said, my career pattern and the passion I have. My career pattern working for women and girls throughout almost four decades. When I was setting the network, it was three decades. I was working in this area, considering what I'm seeing. I know that a lot of work was being done by government and other NGOs. But what I didn't see clearly is how we can coordinate all these efforts, put them together, and make sure that this survival or victim is not continuously re-victimized in the process. And also, I was thinking something was lacking was the issue of privacy. So this led for me to think about all this expertise in the Gambia, everybody doing your small thing. How can all of us come together and do this better? So that came to my mind. And that led me to, to think about forming this uh, network. And so you said the network um, was established in 2009. Can you tell us what um, the objectives or the mission of the network against gender-based violence is? Yeah, the network actually was established in 2009, but the actual work began in 2010. Uh, it began when uh, I got a strong promise from uh, the Foreign Affairs Ministry of Finland uh, through a strong lady, Sarah Rukon and Saya Jevin in Finland. And uh, they worked for an NGO in Finland at the time called uh, RATAS, and the meaning is Christian, I think Christian for Peace in English. So uh, they facilitated for us to get funding from the Foreign Affairs Ministry of Finland. And they actually come in person in the Gambia, and uh, we had a meeting with them. And uh, people who matters at that time were invited, like Child Protection Alliance, Women's Bureau, 
Department of Social Welfare, FLARE, I cannot, FLARE acronym, I cannot actually remember what it means, but it's like something on legal something. So all these people came together and Department of Social Welfare we discussed. Is and that FLARE or FLAG? FLARE, it's different flare. from FLAG. Okay. Yes, it's different from FLAG. Uh, these are the initial group, and YMCA, YWCA, sorry. These are the initial group that came together to discuss about the network, and we form it from there, we kick off. And uh, the most interesting thing is all the initial project uh, uh, management committee of the network who worked with me to make this what it is are all men except myself and Matilda Johnson. So that shows you that, yes, Gambian men, there are very strong men who really feel that the status quo should be king. All of them were men. So when we came together, we look at the objective. But the main objective of, uh, of uh, the network is to make sure that we eradicate or minimize gender-based violence in our society. And the way we should do this is through advocacy, awareness raising, research, training, capacity building. These were some of the things that we agreed that we are going to use that strategy to make sure that we work. And partnership was something that was very emphasized in, the, in, the, in what the network want to do. You talked about capacity building being one of the objectives of the network. Um, who are some of the professionals or what kind of professionals was the network trying to um, train in which sectors of society? Uh, when we conceptualized the network, of course at that time I already have at the back of my mind considering that when I went to Nairobi uh, working on gender and sexual and reproductive health training, uh, one of the things we do was the field work. There is this Nairobi Women Hospital and Nairobi Women's uh, Lawyers Association. I, I learned a lot of things there that I carried back at home. So when we were conceptualizing the network, one thing that came out clearly at the beginning is we wanted to have a one-stop center. So that came out clearly in our objectives. So at the time, when we conceptualized the network, I know that we want to have the one-stop center. The first thing we did was, let us do a desk review and know what is already happening in the country before we just started doing something. And that desk review clearly tells us that a lot of work is being done in the area of gender and sexual, uh, gender and sexual based violence. Uh, but like I said, it was not coordinated. Uh, hospitals were seeing, of course, sexual violence victims and the doctors and the nurses were attending to them. But every doctor or nurses were attending to them the way they learn from the, the training schools, like uh, if somebody is raped, what you are supposed to do here and there. They have different approaches. That's what is happening at the hospital. There is no uniform approach towards it. The documentations were not uniform. The way they handle the survival of victim, they don't have a clue on that. And uh, there was this strong uh, 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 strong belief that even a victim of sexual violence, when it comes to the hospital, the nurses or doctors will not attend to her until she has a police escort. So that was very strong. That came out. Uh, the police also, the way they were handling the sexual violence victims at the time, was like any other assault cases. So all that putting together, uh, we realized that there have been a very big gap in terms of coordination and the way things were done. The capacity is inadequate at the police sector, inadequate at the healthcare delivery. It was inadequate at the Department of Social Welfare for the social workers. So putting all that together, what the network did after the death review was to hire a consultant and develop guidelines and develop standard operational procedures alongside with the guidelines. And these were the guidelines that were used to train trainers. And these are doctors that we brought together to train them. And these are gynecologists 
and other doctors that are working in this area. And they were trained. And alongside, they also provide step-down training for many doctors and nurses across the country. And then another guideline was developed for psychosocial support. But when we were doing this training, really we, we received a lot of technical support from Finland. I remember from Finland, we have somebody working in their police department who is dealing with this, who came. They also support in the training area of the police and the social workers. So that is the capacity building we did in that particular service delivery, the police, the social workers, and the, we call them the clinic workers. Those are the doctors, the nurses, they were all trained. And this training continues up till now. So that is what we did in that area. So what I understand from you is that you realized that there were many different actors who were working on sexual and gender-based violence, and you thought it was better to have it under one roof, essentially a one-stop center of different professionals that would work together and um, essentially coordinate their services to make sure that um, victims are treated the same way and at the same time without duplicating resources. Exactly. Is that correct? Exactly. So this team of professionals, um, you mentioned doctors, um, you've mentioned um, counselors, you've mentioned, um, you've also mentioned the police as well. How, like, is there, um, how is this team put together? Because I'm trying to find out if a um, victim walks into a one-stop center, what can they hope to, um, to expect from that one-stop center? What are the services that are provided and by who? Yeah, I will just touch on the services that are provided at the one-stop center, but I'm reliably informed that uh, somebody from our team who is a medical doctor will also testify here. I know he will explain in detail what actually happened at the uh, one-stop center. But understanding very well, the concept note came from us, so I know what is going to happen there. Uh, but what happened is that before we even bring these people together, we develop an MOU. And uh, we develop an MOU to set up a one-stop center. And uh, this is one unique example that uh, uh, you may find very rare in many countries, and even including the Gambia, where government and civil society come together to work. That's the network. When we were uh, conceptualizing the uh, one-stop center, when we developed the concept note, we have what we call a round table conference. And this round table conference, we make sure that the director of health services was represented, and Department of Social Welfare director, NALA, I think is the National Legal Aid, the, uh, NALA was there, and the Women's Bureau, Action Aid International de Gambia, and uh, Child Protection Alliance, the list goes on. I will apologize for those organizations I cannot just remember off head. Uh, if I refer to my document, maybe I will know all of them. So what we did, we developed an MOU. When we develop an MOU, we make sure that every head of institution signed this MOU and agree that this is going to be their responsibility in the operationalization of the one-stop center. Like the Inspector General of Police signed, to say that this will be the role of the police, like the police will make sure that they do the arrest, they do the investigation, and they prepare the prosecutions. And the justice were part of it, and the justice department, like the police, after they have received the file, they send it to the justice department for review and advice, and they will also take their role as justice department. NALA, of course, we know that they provide legal aid for capital cases. Uh, not other gender-based violence issues. They also, their role is clearly spelled out. Women's Bureau, their coordination role. Child Protection Alliance being a specialist in children issues. Also, their role is clearly spelled out. Uh, people like Action Aid International de Gambia, their role was to support technically and then financially, which they have fulfilled upon reasonable doubt. I must express that Action Aid have stood by the network and get us where we are when it comes to finance. Apart from the Minister of Foreign Affairs, they are the ones who are continuously funding the network 
and also working with the network to develop proposals to get funding from other donors. Uh, after putting all this together, because we have the commitment at the highest level, it was easy to mobilize these key players. These key players are called the care team in the, in the, in the, in the provision of service under the one-stop center. They are called the care team. And the care team comprises of uh, Edward Francis Small Ticking Hospital, where the one-stop center is, Carnifing uh, General Hospital, and then you have FLAG, Female Lawyers Association, the Gambia, and then you have Shelter for Children, Bakote, uh, you have Department of Social Welfare, you have the Police, Gender, and Child Welfare Unit, and the network. These are the people that constitute the care team. The reason why we say the care team, the victim or the survivor, we call it, will work with all these people one way or the other. The intention of the one-stop center is as soon as a victim is at the one-stop center, which is the hospital, then there will be a telephone call and all these other partners will be informed. So that is how the one-stop center are supposed to be operate, uh, are supposed to be operate. But unfortunately, not everything is the way we want it. Those are challenges that I will come later to explain. So when did the one-stop centers, like when did they start um, functioning, essentially? You mentioned that there's one at Edward Francis Small. You mentioned Canifin as well. Um, but when did these one-stop center um, start? Like when was the first one started? 2013. 2013. 2012, lately August. It started August 2012. But the actual work was in 2013. And by then, we piloted at uh, Edward Francis Small Ticking Hospital. And uh, the piloting, the one-stop center actually brought about a lot of improving privacy at Edward Francis. Because when we went there to set up the one-stop center, uh, the gynec ward at one-stop center, at the time, as many hospital wards, the table is in the middle of the ward. And that is where the doctor will sit. And that is where the client will come to explain what happened to the client. And often than known, sometimes clients will come with another issue. When they look around and see that this face is familiar, they will explain something else. That's what happened. So when the network went there to discuss this with the uh, authorities at the hospital, we suggest whether we can have extra rooms. And the network. Uh, uh, was supported in that by the head of the ops and guy, uh, Dr. Patrick, who worked with, uh, and Dr. Bute, they worked with uh, the Edward Francis uh, heads, the, the senior management, until three rooms were provided uh, very close to the gynec ward, just adjacent the gynec ward there. Those were, uh, offices were used for other purposes, but they have to change. In fact, one of them was a senior doctor's office but they moved that place. And then the network uh, looked for funding from Axon Aid, and uh, they refurbished the entire area. And then we have a room where it is a reception, where when a uh, uh, survivor comes or victim, we'll sit there and we make sure that we have very good furniture. You can sit there and we provide a television, uh, a video where other things on sexual violence will be played, and then we will be looking at it, like counseling that we are done for other people. You will be watching that while you relax there. And then there is an examination room where the client can go and be examined, and everything is done in a privacy. And then there is another room which is uh, provided for the police and the social worker, so that when the client goes to those people also, uh, they can provide services within the same room. So that is where we piloted. And that the reason why we did that also is to minimize the victimization. Because uh, Dr. Patrick, whenever he's doing her training on sexual violence, he always brings this question. And uh, we see how uncomfortable uh, the, 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 the trainees find it to answer. When he comes in, he will answer, ask the question, is there anybody who would be willing to explain your last sexual encounter? As soon as he asks that question, people will be looking at each other. What is wrong with doctor? 
my sexual encounter. How can I explain that? They'll be looking at each other. They find it difficult. And uh, here are people who they gave their consent, who want to do it, who derived maybe satisfaction from it, who is their legal partners, find it difficult to explain. Now this is somebody who doesn't want it to happen, who was forced, who undergo pain. You want that person to explain her order. You know that's difficult. So these are people who will go to the police. The police ask them. They explain everything. They move to the hospital. They ask them. They explain everything. They move to the... That is revictimization. That is very difficult. So that is what we are trying to minimize by bringing everybody as scenario. Let the police take whatever he or she wants to do in terms of investigation. Let the social worker prepare whatever he or she wants to do in terms of providing that counseling. Let the doctor take whatever he wants so that the person will narrate just once, not every time you start narrating what happened to you. So that was one of the ideas why we bring all of them together. And in fact, that's very important because the more you get someone to tell such an ordeal, the more likely it is that eventually they might just stop telling it. Because exactly. it's, um, it's frustrating. You mentioned Edward Francis Wall. You mentioned Canifing. Where else are these one-stop centers located um, currently? Yeah, we have like Edward Francis, Canifing, Bansang Hospital. In fact, Bansang Hospital came before Canifing. And then we also, uh, I know they are expanding to SL, uh, Birkama, West Coast region, Soma, Farafenya. I'm not very sure, I think in Basse, but I'm not very sure, like I'm not in now. But I know they have done all the trainings in all these sites, and uh, both for the police, for the social workers, for the doctors and nurses, they have done all the trainings. I'm not very sure whether they have provided them with the registers, whether they are collecting data yet, because normally when we do it, they do some, a little bit of uh, capacity in terms of looking at the structure itself, what they need to put there. But I know they are expanding to all these places. And you mentioned that the one-stop center is managed by a care team of different professionals. Um, do you have any kind of data coming from the care team in relation to um, sexual violence in the Gambia? Data that they've been collecting um, that would help us understand it much better. Yes, uh, the, the, the care team, they collect data. What the network did was uh, we developed a register for uniformity. And uh, the register will, will have the, like the name of the uh, uh, the name of the survival, the age, where the survival lives, and uh, it also has a place for the perpetrator, who is the, the alleged perpetrator, what is the alleged perpetrator's age, where does the alleged perpetrator live, did the survivor know the alleged perpetrator before, what is their relationship, all those are in the register. To have a detail, uh, whatever information from both the survival and the perpetrator. These registers were developed and uh, each of the care team is provided with a register. And uh, we also develop a reporting form that each of the uh, uh, care team have a reporting form. So like uh, the Center for Children have a register, Department of Social Welfare have a register, Police, Child Welfare, Police Gender and Child Welfare Unit have a register, Edward Francis have a register, Sarah Kunda uh, General Hospital have their register, and the Bansam Hospital have their register. So all those that collect information, even FLAG have a register, because we don't only collect sexual violence, we collect different types of gender-based violence, physical, economical, psychological, we collect all of them. So all of them have their register. So this care team, any case that comes to them, they registered in, uh, it into the register, all the detail, what happened, the management, and uh, the one-stop centers like Edward Francis, they have computer. So they enter everything, they have computerized system. They put all the services that are provided, they prepare everything, especially if they are to go to court, they make sure that everything is provided, is, is uh, rec recorded. So the care team meets every quarter 
uh, they meet at the network. And uh, the network program manager will be part of that meeting. And then in that meeting, the reason why the care team meets is to verify the data. Verification is important because uh, we have a very small country and uh, the network don't have a robust database that whereby if like Hadimbuj went to social welfare and my name and ID is entered, if Edward Francis want to enter it, it will reject it. We don't have that kind of database. So to avoid duplication and then raise the figures unnecessarily high, that is why the care team meets quarterly. That is one of the reasons. One of the reasons also they meet quarterly is to make so that they discuss what happened to the case, uh, what is the progress being made with the case, what are some of the challenges, and what they can do together. So when they have that quarterly meeting, each of them comes with their register. For example, if uh, Edward Francis said, January 1st, Hadimboj visited us, everybody will check whether that same Hadimboj have visited you, so that it will be counted only once. If Edward Francis reported, we have 10 sexual violence cases this month, kind of you may report, we have 30, the other one will report. But at the end of the day, when you put all these things together and verify what is the exact number, that is what the network takes and put into their database, and that is what they generate as the report. So that will really minimize duplication, if not totally uh, elevating uh, uh, duplication. So that is what they do. And that data is what we normally provide to our donors, as to these are the number of cases we have seen, and that is what we also provide for all the members of the network, because it's a membership-based organization. And this is what we also say at the steering committee meeting. Because there is a steering committee uh, which is chaired by the Women's Bureau, which also meets quarterly, where the network will go and share this data, and then discussion will be done on the data. So that's what we do with the data. You've provided us with a copy of um, the data that was collected. And I kindly refer to my data. Indeed, I'm not good please at do. Um, I will also provide copies to the commissioners, and then you can just work us through, um, through the data itself. Okay. Uh, this is uh, extraction of only sexual violence, because we have, like I said, we have other gender-based violence, like economic violence, psycho, uh, psychosocial, psychological violence, we have physical violence, but I don't uh, include those ones here. So the data I'm reading is excluding, is only, only sexual violence. There is no other types of violence included in this data. And I began with the 2014 data. 2014, the total sexual violence cases recorded is 92. And the number of adult victims, adult we all know is uh, above the age of 18 years, is 23, uh, which constitute 25% of the total data and number of child victims, 69, and that is 75% of the uh, sexual violence victims for 2014. If we can just focus on, um, on that um, for starters, you mentioned um, number of adult victims and number of child victims, so I take it that um, the distinction here is between those who are under 18 and those who are over 18. Exactly. Can you tell us, um, for instance, how young is the youngest victim that you've come across generally um, throughout your work and what kind of sexual violence um, that entailed? The youngest was 18 months. The youngest 18 was months. 18 months. Can you um, give us an idea, of course, without revealing any identifying information, um, what kind of sexual violence we're talking about for an 18-month-old baby? Actually, when the 18-month child was taken for a medical examination, uh, we learned from the doctors that semen was found on her. So they look at her, they said semen was found on the baby's private parts. So we will conclude that actual, if not penetration, 
but something around the, the vulva of the child has taken place as far as semen was found there. Thank you.